iconic species. And we have looked at the flame uh, where the setup is still the same for the AAS, except now that when you do flame emission, you don't have you don't turn on the the source, okay? And of course, you have to set you have to switch it on to flame emission, where you have everything the same. You have the nebulizer, you have the spray chamber, the burner head, the flame, the monochromator, the detector, and your uh, interface to some microprocessor or computer in order for you to uh, look at your data. However, more so now, when you talk about emission spectroscopy, it's more uh, using plasmas, which are much, much hotter. Okay? This is about the maximum, maybe about 3,000, compared to the plasmas that can go up to eight to 10,000. So usually, when you talk about emission spectroscopy now, it's involving uh, plasmas. Did you all calculate? What was the ratio of for for that particular problem that you did? If it's eight thousand, because you did uh, the the assignment was only three thousand, right? Eight thousand, you would expect it to be a lot more to be the ratio of excited atoms for what was it? Sodium and magnesium ion should be a lot more when you go up to eight eight thousand Kelvin. And another thing that is not a problem when you use plasma is self-absorption. So from the name, self-absorption, you know, it absorbs itself. What is the thing that is being reabsorbed? So if we look at the if we look at a cross section of a flame, this is the front of the flame. Okay, now we're talking about we are talking about emission. Okay, so you have atoms being formed. It becomes excited. When it comes down to ground state, it'll give out its own characteristic wavelength. Let's look at the this this part of the flame, the cross section of the flame. Where now you have this is the burner head. You have and we know that the temperature of the flame is different, right? Which is the hottest part of the flame? Somewhere here, the internal kernel zone. So you have, and as you go outside, it'll be cooler. As you go towards the external part of the flame, it, the temperature drops down. So now, if you were running at a high concentration, okay, high concentration means a lot of atoms produced, a lot of ground state atoms produced as well as the excited states are also more than if it were at lower temperature. Okay? So now at the higher concentration, you have a lot of MO and also M, M star. And you would have more M star in the hotter part of the flame, okay? this internal part. And what happens is when the light is emitted, by the excited atoms, the pop probability of that light being reabsorbed by a ground state atom, which will be found more in the cooler part, is there. Okay, so this is the phenomenon of self-absorption, where MO, the ground state atoms, absorbs not light because there's no source. In flame emission, you don't have the source on. So what happens is uh, reabsorption, self-absorption of light being given out by its friend, by M star. Everybody gets that, what self-absorption means? And this occurs more so at higher concentrations because you have a lot more MO being produced. And so, and this will be more in the cooler part. And the uh, results of of self-absorption shows itself when you look at the when you look at the calibration curve for emission. For example, maybe you have seen it already. I don't know whether you've done it for the sodium. If you 
get a calibration for sodium for emission. So here will be emission intensity versus concentration. If you prepare high concentrations of sodium, you will come to a point where it will no longer be linear. This is not Beer's law, okay? Absorbance, we had said already, absorbance also has a limitation. Absorbance versus con concentration is only linear up to low concentration. Higher than that, absorbance is not linear anymore. But here is not a phenomenon of Beer's law. It's not due to Beer's law not being obeyed. It's due to self-absorption, where this is more likely at higher concentrations. You, get, you no longer get uh, the emission linear to concentration. However, if you were to have a sample here, let's say, at that portion where it's no longer linear, and if you could have enough standards so that you know what that curve is like, you can still use that curve to find out what the concentration is. Because this is not a case of the Beer's law not being obeyed. This is a case where it actually happens in the flame. Okay? This is a phenomenon that takes place in the flame, self-absorption. So you can still use that part of the curve, provided, of course, you know what that curve is like. You cannot have one point here and one point here and, and just estimate how the curve will be like. Okay? So self when you do flame emission spectroscopy, this is something that, hap that will take place at higher concentrations, self-absorption. Um, however, when you go to the ICP, we find that the profile of the plasma is not the same as the flame. It's not cooler on the outside, hotter in the internal part. So self-absorption does not take place uh, in the plasma, even at high concentrations. Okay? And we will also find that be due to this, we get a greater linear dynamic range. Okay, what do you understand by this? Le greater linear dynamic range for the plasma compared to the flame. What do you understand by this phrase here? First, linear dynamic range. What is it? Here. Linear dynamic range. What information do you get if you know the linear dynamic range for a certain element using a, using a certain technique? And let's say emission, emission spectroscopy. If I tell you the linear dynamic range, what will it be? A definition, some numbers, what will it be? Linear dynamic range. What is it? Range. What is range? Numbers, yes. Range? Approximation. What does the word range? What does the word range mean to you? Range. Limit. What limits? From lowest to highest. So you are going to have a range of, of what values? What will it be? When you say linear dynamic range, what do you know? The range will be what? Absorbance, emission, concentration, which? Concentration. That means given a certain range, a lower, a lower number and a higher number, you will know that if it's for AAS, you know that for copper, it is linear within that range. Linear dynamic range, okay? Where it's linear, where the calibration curve is linear, it's a straight line. A versus concentration. Now you're talking about emission, it will be? Emission intensity versus concentration will be linear within some lower limit and upper limit. But we have said just now for the flame, the problem of self-absorption, if you use flame. So the, this <coughs> already limits the linear dynamic range, okay, the linear range. Because at a high concentration, it will no longer be linear. But because when you use plasmas, you don't get that phenomenon. Therefore, you will have a, a, li a greater linear dynamic range. It will be linear until higher concentrations. Okay. Again, I have to repeat. You know, 
When you read something like that in the text, in the notes, you're supposed to understand. I'm getting tired of holding this mic. Maybe I should have it here. God, what a, it shows on an old mic this. Hello? Kau sama? Suara dah besar pun. Tak payah mic pun. Okay. So now we move on to talking about atomic emission, spectroscopy, and we're going to focus it on the inductively coupled plasma, ICP. So okay, the, the hot temperature, the 8,000 Kelvin, is using the plasma. And we will, this is because this <coughs> the most uh, the most commercially available uh, atomic emission spectrometer is the ICP, inductively coupled plasma, okay, ICP. So, how do you form the plasma? The plasma is not equivalent to a flame. It is not a flame. There's nothing burning in the plasma. In the flame, you have hydrocarbon plus some oxygen, oxygen from air that burns, okay, it burns at a certain temperature. Here, the only gas that is used to form the plasma is argon, an inert gas. You may find helium, but the commercially available ones uses uh, argon. Okay? And what kind of energy it, uh, is used? You use a radio frequency generator, uh, which is a couple, or its energy is coupled coupling energy from a RF frequency generator into the gas uh, via a magnetic field. So we, we are going to have a <coughs> copper coil, okay, a metal coil, which is then going to be, <coughs> you know where these black spots are? That's where the coil is. So here, uh, here is shown on a, um, not shown vertically, but here. So this is what is meant by the coil. Those three rings are around the, this is called a torch, the plasma torch. No, but no flame, no flame is formed, okay? So the RF frequency is, um, attached to the or it, to the copper coil, and you get a magnetic field induced. The radio frequency used is about <coughs> 27 megahertz, but you also have another one which is, I think, 40. So here is the torch, which is made of quartz. It consists of three uh, concentric tubes. Okay, you have the one, the inner tube that is not really made of quartz, it's an injector tube through which your sample will come through. And then you have the, another outer uh, quartz tube and the, the most outer one. Okay, so three concentric tubes where, if you see here, two inlets. So the argon gas will be flowing through these two inlets. And around, I don't have the copper coil, around this top part will be the, the three copper coil that you see in that picture, okay? So the radio frequency generator will induce a magnetic field, um, <coughs> which is shown here, H. This is the magnetic field which is induced um, when you couple the RF frequency to the, to the copper coil. Okay. And as shown here, you have a tangential flow of argon into the concentric tube at a tangent, and so it will swirl up. And the middle part will be the, uh, where the sample comes through. So now what happens is, you have argon flowing through, you have this magnetic field in order to light up the plasma. We still call it lighting up the plasma, but it's not having a lighter and lighting up anything because there's nothing that can burn. 
it's only argon which is an inert gas. So to in ignite the plasma, <coughs> what you need is to give it a seed of electrons. So by, by, by a Tesla coil, you will introduce some seed electrons. You introduce some seed electrons. So the electrons will be negatively charged. And because of this uh, negatively charged in a magnetic field, you learn that in physics, what happens? You have a charged species in a magnetic field, you know, the right hand rule or whatever. Like when you have <coughs> current flowing through a. Yeah, you, you, you go and look it up, I'm sure you did it in Form 5. Don't tell me in Form 5 also you can drop physics. Science students dropping physics in Form 5? No. Okay? A right hand rule or a left hand rule or whatever. Where, you know, the flow of charges in a magnetic field will induce some movement. You know, it will move to the something, it will move. Okay? So the electrons negatively charged in the magnetic field will cause this, uh, this is what is called, uh, shown here, these eddy currents. It will move in this um, uh, ring-like thing because of the magnetic field uh, here. And apart from that, you also have the uh, argon. And argon will also be ionized, so you have some argon positively charged ions. So you have your electrons flowing and you also have your argon ions. Okay, gas is seeded with electrons. This will ionize the argon gas. The electrons will accelerate in the magnetic field and uh, it reaches in energy sufficient to ionize the gaseous atoms. And subsequent collisions with the other gaseous atoms further uh, induce more ionization. So the magnetic field causes the ions and electrons to flow in a horizontal plane, the one that we've we shown just now. Here. However, because they are one is negatively charged, the electrons, and the other one, the argon ions are positively charged, they move in different directions. And because of all this activity in the uh, gases, uh, we get a plasma form. But this plasma is, as soon as you shut off the argon, poop, it's, it's gone. Because there's no more argon. There's no more argon ions or electrons formed. Okay? So as soon as you shut off your plasma, your argon gas, it goes off. No explosion because it's not, it's not a flame. It's not something burning. Okay? But you see those black things on that quartz tube is because the, the placement of the tube, you know, if it touches the coil or something, so eventually it will, it will because the quartz tube will be very hot. The plasma form, you, you see that picture, it's like a flame. Well, that's what it looks like, and you cannot see it directly with your eyes. Um, so it is very hot, so the quartz tube will also be hot. So if you touch the, the coil, you know, you, that's why you get some um, discharge of ch charges or whatever, and causes the, this thing to be black. self-sustaining as long after it has been lit up it will continue to uh, the plasma will continue to be self-sustaining until like I said you shut off the argon and through the center of the the central tube is where this center, uh, this inner, the innermost tube is connected to the nebulizer. So the aerosol is introduced through the middle tube and it will go in here and all those things that we talked about in the flame. The desolvation, the evaporation, volatilization, etc., etc., all will occur in the plasma.
just like the flame, the temperature of the plasma also is different in different regions. However, unlike the flame, the innermost, the hottest part is here, these blue lines shown here, the ones, the region inside the coil. Okay. And here you have 8,000, and as it goes further up, higher and higher above the load coil. So we call that copper coil around that tube, uh, we call, call it a load coil. So as we see, the temperatures are lower as you go higher and higher above the coil. And this bluish uh, two spots here are the regions which is the highest temperature. Usually, uh, observation is what, between 15 to 20, or is it 10 to 15, as we said here. The region which the normal electrical zone, 10 to 20 millimeters above the coil, okay? Because the monochromator, you can set which region of which part of the uh, plasma the light will be focused onto your monochromator here. This, imagine this is the flame, you have the wavelength selector here. Wavelength selector with a tiny slit, okay? With a very uh, small, narrow slit. So, which part of the plasma that you want to focus onto that slit of entrance slit of the monochromator will be up to you because this is adjustable. So, normally it's between 10 to 20, um, this is the region, 20, 10 to 20 millimeters above the, above the load coil which is the observation, uh, which is observed, used for uh, measuring the emission for various elements. Hottest part, like I said, 8 to 10,000. And you have a very dynamic uh, plasma with all these kinds of uh, species in the plasma. Um, and it's not in thermal equilibrium because you have ionization occurring. Recombination means ion plus electron becoming the atomic species. Excitation, de-excitation, and what have you. So as we see here, unlike the flame, the flame you say the hottest part is the middle part, and it's, as it goes outside, it's um, the temperature drops, okay? So you get self-absorption, but but for plasmas, that's that's not the case. So self-absorption is not a problem with um, when you use plasmas. The RF generator, which is um, which induces that magnetic field, there are two types, one at the 27 megahertz or one at the 40. When we say we observe between 10 to 20, why do we do it lower? We do not want to have this region, this region where you have this very high temperature being focused onto the monochromator because uh, that's the region where you have uh, this continuum. When the argon recombines with the electron it, to form uh, an argon atom, it will release energy. And you, that's, that's where your continuum background. So a very high intensity uh, emission, which is uh, a continuum. So you don't want to focus the area where this uh, continuum background emission is very high onto your uh, entrance, entrance slit of your monochromator. So basically, that's common is the same kind of nebulizer that we were talking about for the flame, the pneumatic nebulizer. You have a, a glass concentric nebulizer, which means that the middle, when you talk about concentric nebulizer, that, that means uh, the inner tube is a sample, the outer tube, you have the, uh, the gas flowing through. And of course, the gas used in the nebulizer will have to be argon also. It cannot be another gas. It cannot be air. Okay? 
Um, some other nebulizers use a, a more specific nebulize, uh, nebulizer name use is a cross flow nebulizer. Unfortunately, oh, I had it in the other. I don't think I have any diagrams here. Oh, I do, I do. Of course, I do. Okay, just now this was the concentric nebulizer. Similar idea to the nebulizer that we showed for the flame. So you have your inner tube through which your sample will come through, and you have an outer tube where you have your gas flowing here. So the same idea, low pressure region, and so when the sample comes here, it will form aerosol. However, different from the nebulizers used in the flame, here you have to pump in your sample. You have to use a pump to get your sample into the nebulizer. Uh, you don't, like for the flame nebulizer, you, it's just a capillary action that will, you know, that will pull up your sample through the tube. So this is the concentric nebulizer for the ICPOES. Please take note, okay? ICPOES, this term, optical emission spectroscopy, is a term used by Perkin Elmer. Perkin Elmer is one of the uh, companies that you know puts out ICPOES. But the more general term is you should also be familiar with is ICPAES, atomic emission. Optical is you know like I said used more by Perkin Elmer. You have the mine heart, which is also a concentric nebulizer, a concentric type. Okay, you have your sample going through the inner tube, and you have an outer, outer shell. Okay, so here you pump your sample through. Here you have your argon gas going through. Very, very tiny holes. So you can't afford to put in samples with any specs, any undigested specs, that means still solid, definitely will get blocked. Another one is also amount of dissolved salts. The nebulizer for the flame can take um, more dissolved salts compared to the nebulizers for the ICP because the, the holes are even tinier. So if you have a lot of salts dissolve, even though your solution is clear and you have salts dissolve, what will happen is in time, these salts will dry up, the solution will dry up and clog up that hole, the nozzle. So it cannot take uh, <coughs> samples with too high dissolved salts. A different design, no longer the concentric nebulizer, this is a cross flow, so from the name cross flow you have a flow of the sample and the argon at right angles to one another okay so this is the setup of the nebulizer you have your sample being pumped through here from the bottom and you have your gas flowing through the top so the idea is still the same thing you know that's how your aerosol is being formed so this is a cross flow. The other design is Babington. Babing, when the word Babington means the nebulizer can take higher amount of <coughs> dissolved salts <coughs> compared to the previous uh, cross flow or the mine heart. Okay, Babington. When you see Babington, means it's the nebulizer that can handle a higher amount of dissolved salts, even from for the flame. I'm sure you, uh, you can get a, a, a nebulizer, a Babington-like nebulizer for the flame also, which can handle a higher amount of dissolved salts. The problem is with when you have too much dissolved salts, the clogging of the nebulizer occurs. So, okay, so with this, the Babington, the design is somewhat different, so it can handle a higher amount of dissolved salts. Let's see how the design is different. This is a a basic idea of the Babington where you have a glass tube enclosed and it has a hole. Orifice is a hole, okay? So argon will go, uh, will be pushed out through that tiny orifice. The sample is now pumped to form a film on top of that glass tube. 
So as you as that film goes across that orifice through which the gas comes out, you get aerosol being formed. So why does the Babington, how can it handle a higher amount of dissolved salts? It's because the sample essentially does not go through a tiny hole. For the cross flow, the mine heart, as we have seen, you pump your sample through this tiny hole. Similarly for the uh, mine heart or the cross flow. So there, it cannot handle too much dissolved salts. Uh, unlike the Babington, the sample does not has to form a film over the tubing and the glass tube that has a hole. Okay, I must point out that. Nah? Tube and tubing. Tube, tubing is some kind of tubing, you know, for your fish, whatever, you know, for your fish tank, etc., etc. Okay, this is not tubing, this is tube. So, again, Babington, the word, when you see Babington nebulizer means Okay, can handle high amount of dissolved salts compared to the other kinds of nebulizer. This is another design of the Babington, the V groove. So here you have <coughs> a V groove, okay, a groove in a V shape where you have your sample coming out of an, a hole, and at the bottom is the where the gas comes out. So, uh, <coughs> as the sample comes out, it flows uh, uh, along the hole where the uh, gas comes out and you get aerosol being formed. Okay? Just, just a different design, a V-groove design of the Babington. But the idea is the same. The sample is not forced to go through a very tiny hole. What else do I want to say about nebulizers here? Cross flow nebulizers can only handle less than 0.1 to 1% dissolved salts, dissolved solids. Another difference, like I said, the sample now has to be pumped through. You have to use a pump, a peristaltic pump. And the rate at which the sample is uh, pumped into the nebulizer is in the range of 1 to 2 milliliters per minute much slower compared to flame AS. If you were to do the experiment that I told you to do, how do you measure the sample uptake rate for a flame AS? The rate at which that... So here is your nebulizer and you have your capillary tube into your sample. This is flame AS nebulizer. I want to measure the rate at which this sample is being sucked up into your nebulizer for your flame, flame AS. It's not pumped through, okay? It's just atmospheric pressure pushing it up, going through. Because here you form a low pressure region, so here higher pressure pushes it up. The rate here, how do you measure it? I think we mentioned it once before. How do you measure this sample uptake rate? Use a graduating cylinder. See the initial level, put the tube in, up in a certain time, measure how much solution has been taken up. Then you measure the mils per minute, it's the sample uptake rate, the sample aspiration rate, all means the same. Aspiration, uptake. Okay? For the flame, it's between 5 to 10 mils per minute. How can you adjust this? That day I showed the nebulizer when you, you adjust that nebulizer adjusting knob. That controls the rate at which the sample is being sucked up. So, in comparison, the plasma cannot handle this high uh, uh, sample uptake rate. Because if you pump in the, uh, the, the sample at too high a rate, this middle, that whitish ceramic thing is where the sample is pumped through. If you push the sample at too high a rate, it will blow out the plasma. You know, because the gas has to be at a certain position where, where all the where all that collision, uh, 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 the electrons moving, the ions moving has to be at a certain place. Okay, if you push 
the inner tube with too high a flow rate of argon because the the nebulizer uses argon so you essentially push it out and you the flame the plasma goes off so only 1 to 2 mils per minute slow okay. and you also want uh, smaller droplets you can't afford to have two big droplets because this is going to be um, um, affect the overall transport efficiency transport efficiency means how much of the trans how much of the sample can be transported into the flame so these are differences in the sample introduction between the plasma and the flame uh, another kind of nebulizer different from the babington or the cross flow etc is the ultrasonic more expensive of course it uses a transducer which moves at which vibrates at a certain frequency your sample is then pumped onto the surface of that transducer and because of that movement you get aerosol being produced uh, but the amount of aerosol produced because the this produces uh, more more aerosol and more smaller droplets okay so when you use the ultrasonic nebulizer you need to use it together with a desolvation unit from the word desolvation what does it mean what is this process of desolvation deionize water what does deionize water mean deionize same kind of idea deionize you always use deionize water in your lab what is it no carbon dioxide no from the name deionize nyah ion i'm sure you didn't you, you didn't do it in bm anyway deionize means ions ions has been reduced that's why you how do you get your deionize water uh, through a ion exchange resin i'm sure at home do you have some uh, not deionizer but i'm sure it works the same way what is it your water filter whatever they call it you know, I'm sure some of your homes have. I, as a chemist, do not have one. So, <laughs> your diamond, whatever brands of water filter, so that you don't, you drink purified water. Okay? So, yeah, you get rid of your bacteria plus ions. So, deionize means you have lessened the ions. See here, desolvation means you get rid of the solvent, right? So, you must use it together with a desolvation unit. Essentially, is a tubing with which is heated so that as the aerosol goes through this desolvation unit it will become dry particles okay the solvent will be evaporated will be heated up so you when you get when you get it when it flows into the plasma it will not be uh, aerosol droplets with a lot of water because you don't want to use the energy of the plasma to uh, to evaporate your your solvent okay because the ultrasonic nebulizer the amount of aerosol produced is a lot more compared to the other kinds of nebulizer and also finer droplets so you're going to get a, a, a large volume going through so you don't want you know you don't want it to mess up the the plasma so to be used with a desolvation unit another kind of sample introduction same idea as the graphite Electrothermal means something is heated by electrical means. Here, what we have is <clears throat> same kind of idea. Your graphite rod, your sample, it's being heated, and you have flow of argon, which will then bring the uh, vapor, uh, the gas produced into your into your plasma. So you you marry the electrothermal vaporization with the icp you use it as a means of not to excite or electron uh, ions atoms or whatever but it's just to uh, 
vaporize the sample, etc. And to introduce that to the plasma. So another sample introduction technique. So as we go, as you go to, <coughs> which I have yet to do, your, 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 your papers to prepare you for your talk. As you go higher and higher up, now you learn the basic. When you go higher up, it's all marrying different techniques. Okay? Uh, you use electrothermal with ICP, or you use uh, HPLC with ICP with mass spec. You know all these uh, <coughs> techniques in tandem. You you marry them to get the best. Now ah, here's a story about the uh, okay. See the ultrasonic sample transport is ten to fifteen percent. So you know you you produce a lot more aerosol. We, st we still have the spray chamber. Okay, so you have your nebulizer, your spray chamber, and then it goes to the ICP torch. ICP torch. Okay, so here is the going to be spray chamber and your nebulizer. Two kinds that are shown here. You have A, which is a Scott double pass. And your single pass. Uh, let's look at the single pass first. You have your nebulizer, and here's the, what I was talking about last time: the impact bead. The, in the flame, also you can have an impact bead, where the nebulizer, the aerosol produced, will hit the impact bead and form even smaller droplets. And this will then go up to the plasma way, uh, torch, where you have your plasma up here. The double pass is exactly what the what uh, the name says. Uh, you you have to go through uh, another a longer path before you go up to the torch. So as you are going through this longer path, you will get rid of your bigger droplets, essentially. So you need a spray chamber. Of course, this spray chamber is made out of quartz. However, when you go to the ICP mass spec, you will find a spray chamber which is made of some polymeric material, riton or whatever. You know more more uh, lifetime which will be higher and more resistant to all kinds of acids and what, what have you. This, so after leaving uh, all the various ways of how uh, the sample is introduced into the plasma, the next section is just looking at uh, excitation. Because remember why we want to measure emission, the atoms produced must be excited okay, before you can get any emission out. So here is the dip <coughs> various mechanisms of how does excitation, uh, how does it occur in the plasma. Okay, you have your thermal, that means from heat energy, uh, where you get <coughs> Uh, either excitation or uh, ionization. Okay, it's due to collision between collision between different species to essentially produce that excited metal ion or metal sorry metal atom. Or you have pending ionization or excitation, which is due to collision between the ground state and argon metastable species. Charge transfer, where you get some transfer of charge between the ions and atoms to essentially produce the here what is shown is the excited um, ion okay x plus star star means is an excited excited uh, state so three kinds of mechanism of how excitation occurs or ionization and we find that um, most elements at the temperature of the icp are singly ionized plus plus one. Uh, emission lines, most sensitive emission lines are ion lines. When you say ion lines, mean emission from ionic species. Atom lines means emission from atomic species. So, uh, for example, we recognize this, this uh, particular wavelength. 324 is an uh, is the wavelength that I always use to, to describe copper absorption. So here is emission. 
Copper 1 doesn't mean Cu plus. Eh? The terminology here means this one is the atom line, Cu, Cu plus. Mn2 means it's the ion line. So most sensitive emission lines are the emission from excited ionic species. And you would imagine that there may, are many ions formed because of the temperature, 8,000 to 10,000. Of course, you will get a lot more ions formed if uh, compared to if you were to use an air settling flame. Okay. And the last one is, this is not just a story, it is commercially available. So you have a side on ICP or an end on. Side on means, this is the plasma, you have the flame-like plasma up here. Your monochromator is face, is side on. The <coughs> emission intensity will be from here. The excited ions or atoms will form here, and light. You will be viewing light at it on its side. The other one is the anon. This is called also radial. Okay, side on is called radial. Radial configuration. Here is axial. That means you're looking at the ion through its axis, uh, uh, through the plasma through its axis. So here, and on. And of course, there are advantages. Why do you want to go to end, uh, end on rather than radial? This initially was just radial. Now you have both. And with that, we, um, we leave it for Wednesday. Oh, I, I really have to get those articles.